Okay, let's get this show on the road. And let me know if people can hear me. So far, yes, they can. Excellent. And today we're going to be talking about uh, settling and settling of spheres. And this is continuing and will be the last lecture on drag. And then after that, this we're moving into uh, flow and piping systems and energy losses, friction losses. I've also turned on uh, the um, transcription and we'll see how well that works because this is the computer trying to figure out what I'm saying through my mask and it's uh, not always a good transcription we'll see so in this uh, lecture this is following up on three-dimensional drag and we're specifically looking at systems that have um, a sphere now although it could be any object so this is good for any three-dimensional object, but for today, we're going to focus on spheres because it does have engineering applications. And as you know, uh, for the system, we're going to have a free stream velocity or a relative velocity between the fluid and the particle. And then the particle is going to have characteristics of a size, specific weight, specific gravity, and the fluid has fluid characteristics of density, viscosity, kinematic viscosity. So uh, from last time, we talked about the drag equation, and this is what's being used when we're talking about settling of particles. It's the same momentum or inertial form of the drag equation. And in this case, we are either using the equation to solve for the drag force, which actually has very limited application when we're talking about settling of particles, unless you're uh, skydiving. The more practical example for engineering applications is to solve for the velocity. And again, this is a relative motion that we would be talking about. So in this case, if you think to a stable equilibrium system, when the particle, in this case, the parachute is, is falling at a terminal velocity or a settling velocity or a constant velocity, the system is in steady state. And if we look at the sum of the forces in the vertical direction, it just says that the drag force which would be acting vertically upwards, would be offset by the weight. So we know the weight of the uh, particle in this case. The drag force, of course, is going to oppose that motion. And when those two are equal, the momentum or inertial form of the drag equation would then describe for us the um, I was hoping for that text to go away. The settling velocity, capital U, or commonly what we use for settling velocity is V sub X, the settling or the terminal velocity. So the drag coefficient, and this is a slide from last class, the drag coefficient depends on the fluid characteristics, which uh, are uh, involved in the Reynolds number, as well as the particle characteristics, typically the smallest dimension of the um, object perpendicular to the velocity vector. The drag coefficient is going to depend on shape. And if you recall in the handout I gave you, as well as your textbook, there are a lot of drag coefficients for the different shapes. For this lecture, we're going to focus on spheres. And then uh, in general drag coefficients, there are two dimensional ones in which you're talking about something that has infinite length a flagpole might be considered that way. And then three-dimensional drag coefficients are again for, for finite shapes, dimensions in all three coordinate axis directions. And then again, just as with flat plates, we could have a smooth surface or a roughened surface. A smooth surface means you would start with a laminar boundary layer at the leading edge, and then it might go to transition and then turbulent. If you roughen the surface, it's impossible to have either a laminar boundary layer or the laminar sublayer. And so it's all turbulent boundary layer over the object. 
And that has a, a lot to do with reattachment of the boundary layer and controlling drag, as we've discussed. So this is the figure from your handout, and it has the drag coefficients for cylinders, as well as the drag coefficient for a smooth sphere. And we're going to be using the smooth sphere diagram for most of today's, today's lecture. So for the settling problem, we use the drag co equation. This is the fundamental equation we'll use. We may know the particle diameter size, therefore we would know the area. So particle size is involved in the area. The particle size is also involved with the Reynolds number. If we know the particle specific weight or the particle specific gravity, then we know the particle's weight. And remember from the previous slide, in a system that's at, at equilibrium, constant terminal velocity, the weight is equal to the drag force. And then again, if we know the fluid, we know the fluid properties, which one, you see one fluid property in the drag equation, the density of the fluid, but the other fluid properties will appear in the Reynolds number, density and viscosity or uh, kinematic viscosity. So in the settling problem, typically you do not know the settling velocity. Now you may be given the settling velocity in certain cases, or that might be your design condition where you're trying to achieve a certain settling velocity. But if you don't know the settling velocity, you can't calculate the Reynolds number. And if you can't calculate the Reynolds number, you can't find the coefficient of drag. So possible solutions for when you're after the settling velocity. One is to develop a theoretical equation. And the other solution uh, path is to use a trial and error approach. And I'm gonna be explaining both of those through examples in today's lecture. In the trial and error approach, again, from the last slide, what you typically don't know is the settling velocity, which means you don't know the drag coefficient. So you're either guessing at one of those in order to find the other. And again, it's a trial and error uh, procedure in which you assume something, compute something, and then see how bad your guess was, and then modify your guess until your answer is in agreement. So in the, from the handout on page six, it's entitled Drag on Three-Dimensional Objects. And this is specifically about drag on spheres. So you might open your handout to that page. Hopefully you still have it. Um, a lot of what's on that page, you'll find on the next slides. So again, what type of settling? We're talking about where the system is at steady state. You're at terminal velocity or terminal settling velocity. When that is true, the drag is equal to the weight. If you're not at terminal velocity, the particle is accelerating and the sum of the forces is not zero, the sum of the forces is mass times acceleration. So that's why it's convenient to take this into uh, the terminal velocity or, or a steady state system because the sum of the forces is equal to zero in the vertical direction. So from your handout, this is cropped right from your handout, the form of the drag equation, when you look at a free body diagram, so in this case, we would have a particle and it's got a weight, W, it's got a drag force acting on it, but the other thing that's acting on it is if it's a particle that is heavier than the fluid, you have a buoyant force acting on it. In the other case, if you have a particle that's lighter than the fluid, for example, a bubble that's rising in the fluid, that will modify the, um, some of the forces in the vertical direction um, in order to uh, account for the fact that in this case, the weight of the object is much less than the drag force. Um, what's missing in the equation before is the buoyant force. And why it's missing is because when I first introduced you to this, I was looking at a parachutist. And in air, the buoyant force is very commonly neglected. In water, we cannot neglect it. So in liquids, we have to include the buoyant force. In air, 
you can, or gases, you can certainly include the buoyant force, but it's gonna be a very, very small number. So that's the distinction. So the weight is the particle specific weight times the volume. So you need to know the specific weight of the material or the specific gravity of the material. The buoyant force is the fluid specific weight times again, the particles volume. And then the volume of the sphere for both of those, since we're looking at settling in spheres is pi over six d cubed. This equation is in your appendix, should you ever be scrambling to remember it on an exam. So if you look at the force equilibrium, and this again is drag force is equal to weight minus buoyant force. So this is right from the previous equation. The weight is the volume times the specific weight of the particle. And the buoyant force is the specific weight of the fluid times the volume of particle. So this is the same as the previous uh, slide, although what we've done here is to substitute in all of the things that we know. And then uh, a key in this is this is for water. If you were looking at settling a, of something other than water, you would put the specific weight of the fluid there. And then you would not get this last form of the equation. If you divided out the specific weight of the fluid from gamma X and, uh, sorry, if you divided the specific weight of water out of gamma X and gamma of the fluid, you would get SX minus SF, where SX is the specific gravity of the particle and SF would be the specific gravity of the fluid. Again, that's when you don't have water. The specific gravity of water is one. And that's what the one represents when you see SX minus one, that's basically representing the buoyant weight of an object. So a um, gentleman named Stokes studied settling of spheres when there was only a laminar boundary layer. And remember when we talked about boundary layer theory on flat plates, we had from Blasius a theoretical description of what the velocity was at any point in the boundary layer. From the velocity profile, we could get shear stress. So what Stokes did was use that laminar velocity profile over the entire sphere, calculate the shear stress over the entire sphere and integrate it. And what Stokes found was that when we have a Reynolds number, remember the Reynolds number is the settling velocity times the particle diameter over kinematic viscosity of the fluid. So when we have a, a Reynolds number less than 0 0.1, the drag calculated from the laminar boundary layer is 3 pi mu particle size settling velocity. And the important thing to remember is this is suitable, or this equation is fine up to this Reynolds number of 0.1. What happens after 0.1? You don't have laminar boundary layer anymore. Once you get above a Reynolds number of 0 0.1 for a sphere, there is some transitional boundary layer near the trailing edge of the sphere. And so you can't use this theory anymore. The momentum or inertial form of the drag equation is our old friend, one half C sub D rho A B squared, where again, B sub S is the settling velocity, density of the fluid is the rho, and A is the cross-sectional area of the sphere, which in this case is a circle. And then for settling in water, what we can do is you had equations one, two, and three, and I'm gonna quickly go backwards. So here's equation one. This is from a force equilibrium. Equation two is the laminar settling equation. And equation three is the general form or the inertial form of the drag equation. All three, three equations had drag on the left-hand side. And therefore, what you can do is equate one to the other to get rid of drag. So if we equate or combine equations two and three on your handout, you get equation four. And remember, whenever you use equation two, 
which was Stokes equation, there's a caveat because there is a caveat on equation two. It's only good for a Reynolds number up to 0 0.1. So equation four gives you an exact solution for the coefficient of drag. And equation five gives you an exact equation for the settling velocity. And as I'm gonna show you in examples, these are direct solutions. If we combine equations one and three, and there were no caveats or restrictions on equations one and three, then you get this more generic form of the settling velocity. And uh, you'll understand why I isolate C sub dv squared once we get into the solutions. So when we go to, again, the um, uh, first figure on your handout and we focus on the smooth spheres, again, at 0 0.1, for the Reynolds number, which is the vertical axis where it crosses the horizontal axis. When you're at a Reynolds number less than that, you're laminar. And then from there up to about 10 to the, a little more than 10 to the fifth, your transition. And greater than that, your turbulence. What does that mean? Up to a Reynolds number of 0 0.1, the entire surface of the sphere is covered by a laminar boundary lift. Once you get above 0 0.1 and less than about three times 10 to the minus five, you have laminar on the leading edge, and then it's followed by a transitional boundary layer, which has the laminar sublayer and the turbulent layer over it. And that's what's contained on the sphere everywhere. At the low end of that, when you're say at 0 0.5, most of the sphere is covered by a laminar boundary layer and there's very short zone of transition. As you move up past 10 to the fourth, there's a very small region where you have laminar boundary layer on the sphere at the leading edge, and then the rest has transitional on it. Once you get past Again, about three or four times 10 to the fifth, you have all three of those boundary layers from laminar to transition and turbulent finally on the trailing edge. The farther, farther you go with the Reynolds number to the right, the more the turbulent boundary layer occupies on the trailing edge of that sphere. Okay. And so you can see how the boundary layer and, and the uh, how the boundary layer affects the drag coefficient on these spheres. And that equation, when we combine equations two and three, that the drag coefficient is 24 over the Reynolds number, you can see this is a log-log plot. And on a log-log plot, 24 of the Reynolds number is a straight line. So laminar ends at Reynolds number of 0 0.1, but very often and uh, at the bottom of this page, you can see the text from your handout. It's not uncommon for engineering purposes, people will use the laminar equations up to a Reynolds number of one. You do start to get significant errors, but again, they're not considered too severe for engineering purposes. Some people in the transition zone or maybe up to yeah, almost for the entire transition zone, and you'll see this equation next, have fit an equation to this curve. Other people have fit equation to just different parts of the curve. So for example, on the next slide from your textbook, when you have smooth spheres with Reynolds number less than 300,000, the equation by Clifton Gauvin looks like this. It's an ugly equation, but Again, that plot was coefficient of drag versus Reynolds number. And it looks something like that. And when you have a Reynolds number less than 300,000, what you would see is the right-hand side of the equation only has Reynolds number in it. When the Reynolds number gets really small, this term disappears this term disappears and you're left with 24 over the Reynolds number. As the Reynolds number gets larger and larger, 
because of the Reynolds number here, this whole first term starts to disappear and the second term is more operative. When you're in the middle of this range, the two terms are important, okay? So again, this is from your textbook. This is much easier than trying to read off of that figure that I gave you or the figure that's in your textbook and trying to get any more than one place accuracy to the right of the decimal point. So off of the chart, it's easy to read 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It's really hard to read 0.351. Okay. So this equation is handy and I'll, we'll use it in the examples. And again, other people, these are not in your book, have fit equations to just certain pieces. Why? Because they seem to fit very specific circumstances that we're trying to create in engineering application. Okay, so just be aware that we have the figure we can always use for any object. Today, we're just talking about spheres, but it could be any object. And people have fit equations to the relationship between drag coefficient and Reynolds. So first example, we're gonna have a smooth sphere, of course, and it's going to be settling in water and I'm giving you the temperature. So once you give the temperature, that dictates what the fluid properties will be. It's settling at a terminal velocity of one foot per second. So we're actually measuring this. The sphere diameter is two millimeters. So we measured the sphere uh, diameter beforehand. And the question is for this situation, what's the specific gravity of the particle? So in this case, um, practical application of this when you're panning for gold. That's the practical application. Um, gold particles are heavier because the specific gravity of gold is, is high. And so they settle out first. No one's going through these calculations when they're sifting for, for gold, but this is what's operating. So the drag equation, the inertial form of the drag equation I give you, and remember the Reynolds number is what we need to get the drag coefficient. And ultimately, again, from your handout, the very first equation is the force equilibrium equation in the vertical. Some of the forces equal zero. And so the drag force is equal to the weight minus the buoyant force. And so that's the equation below. And in that equation, we have the diameter, it's two millimeters. Specific weight of the um, particle is unknown. We're trying to find SX, the specific gravity of the particle. We know we have water at 50 degrees, so we look, can look at the specific weight of water. So on the next slide, at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, we see the kinematic viscosity, density, and specific weight of water. Those are found right from the back of your book. The diameter, since we're gonna work this problem in uh, our system of units, British Gravitational System, BGS, there is 304.8 millimeters per foot. There's 25.4 millimeters per inch. Okay. So that's how we got the conversion. And so we know the diameter and remember diameter lowercase d, drag uppercase d. So we know the velocity, we know the diameter, that should be d, and we know the kinematic viscosity. So we can calculate the Reynolds number, it's 465. First question you should always ask yourself, is that greater or less than 0 0.1? Is it laminar or not? Since it's greater than 0 0.1, you do not have laminar settling. You just should be aware of that. <clears throat> so we could go into this diagram at 465. So uh, on the diagram, again, this is from your high handout, 10 to the two is 100, 10 to the three is 1000. We have 465. And so you go up to the curve. And again, it's really hard to read. You know, it looks like it's between 0.5 to 0.6. It's about the best you can do. However, if we go to the equation, again, Clifton Gold N, if your Reynolds number is less than 300,000, we have a Reynolds number of 465. 
that's less than 300,000. So we can use this equation to calculate our drag coefficient. And when we put the Reynolds number of 465 into this equation, we get a drag coefficient of 0.58, which again, when we just went to the figure on the previous slide, the best we can do is say it's uh, somewhere between 0.5 and 0.6, okay? So this is a much better answer. I would recommend you use the equation. It's not that hard. So for a drag coefficient of 0 0.58, now we know everything on the right-hand side of this equation in order to calculate the drag force. Once we have the drag force, again, we are able to calculate the specific gravity of the particle. That's what you were after. So for the drag force, we're gonna put everything we know into the drag equation. And remember the area is the cross-sectional area normal to the approach velocity. That's a circle. And so the area in the circle is pi over four d squared. And so from that, we would get, whoops. No, stop that. So um, what we would get is that the drag force is 1.9 times 10 to the minus five pounds. Again, question. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we can't see the screen on Zoom. I think you have to reshare it. Okay. Possibly. Keith, thank you for letting me know that. I don't know how that happened, but consider it undone. Okay, you can see that now. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So um, all I did was uh, fill in that last li uh, line since I lost uh, a video. And we have a drag force now of 1.9 times 10 to the minus five pounds. And again, now that we know that, we go to the force e equilibrium equation. Remember, this comes from some of the forces in the vertical are equal to zero. And if positive is upwards, that would be equal to the drag force minus the weight plus the buoyant force. Again, that's for a particle that's settling. It's got a weight and it's settling at V sub S. That's the one foot per second. And the drag force and the buoyant force are opposing it. That's in a something that's settling or moving downward, something that's moving upward, a buoyant particle, uh, you would switch around the, some of the directions of these uh, forces. So again, from the equation one of your handout, for this force equilibrium system, the drag force is equal to a function of the specific gravity of the particle. So we just calculated the drag force, and the only thing we do not know in this equation now is the specific gravity of the particle. And so when we uh, put everything we know into this equation, the specific gravity is 3.06. That's kind of on the heavier end. A typical sand particle would have a specific gravity of around 2.6 to 2.65. And if we know the specific gravity, the specific weight is just that specific gravity times the specific weight of water. So the specific weight of the particle is 191 pounds per cubic foot. Okay. Uh, are there any questions that are coming in on that one? All right, so that is probably um, the less common use of the settling equations. The more common use is to figure out or calculate the terminal velocity of a particle. And remember, I talked about this last time. If you have some settling tank, the fluid is moving in this direction at some velocity v. A particle enters on the left-hand side, and it's also being acted on by the settling velocity. And what you're hoping is that that particle reaches the bottom before it reaches the other end. That is how you settle it. And you have the ability to design the tank dimensions, whether it's the length, the height, or the width, to uh, accommodate both of these velocities. So right now, we're just trying to understand what's the settling velocity, 10 millimeter diameter sphere, so that's uh, in the sand, almost a, a, a gravel size particle. It's got a specific gravity of 2.5, and it's 
in water at five degrees centigrade. So we're gonna work this problem in metric, in SI. So because we know we have five degrees centigrade water, we know that the density is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter squared. We know the specific weight, the viscosity, and the kinematic viscosity. Okay. So we do not know the Reynolds number because we don't know the settling velocity. If, and this is from what we developed today, if we had laminar settling, we could use this equation. So we can certainly try this equation, but then if we do and we get an answer, we better make sure that the Reynolds number is less than 0 0.1, okay? From the last problem, we had a specific gravity of a particle of 3.05, a little bit um, uh, smaller, a little bit larger than this one, but the particle size was one fifth. It was um, two millimeters. And that had a Reynolds number of 465. So typically for sand and larger particles, you do not have laminar settling. But again, we could go in this blindly and just assume this, but we better check the Reynolds number when we're all done. This is a direct solution for settling velocity. If you do not have laminar settling, meaning that you have laminar transition or laminar transition and turbulent boundary layer characteristics on the particle, this is a trial and error solution. Why? This form of, of the equation is what combined equations one and three, the force equilibrium equation with the general momentum form of the drag equation. And we don't know the Reynolds number because we don't know the settling velocity. So we don't know the drag coefficient. So the left-hand side coefficient of drag times settling velocity squared are the unknowns. The right-hand side is everything we know. In this problem, we know the particle diameter. We know the acceleration due to gravity. We know the specific gravity of the particle. And so you have one equation and two unknowns, which means you can't solve it. There's an infinite number of solutions. In order to solve this equation, you need a boundary condition or another equation. The boundary condition we use is the plot of drag coefficient versus Reynolds number. That's how we solve this. So let's assume for argument's sake, that we're going to uh, assume it's laminar settling. So in this case, the settling velocity is the diameter squared divided by 18 times the viscosity times um, what you'll see is I took gamma X minus gamma H2O is equal to the specific weight of water times SX minus one. And that's what you see on the latter part of that. The specific weight of water times the difference between the specific gravity of the particle minus the specific gravity of water. And that gives us a velocity of 54.1 meters per second. I don't know if you have any feel for that. Um, 54 meters is uh, 150 feet. Maybe that's uh, around the length of Greg Hall. And that particle would go the length of Greg Hall in one second. That's an incredibly high velocity. But when we make this assumption, the very next thing we need to do is make sure we meet the criteria that go along with this equation. We need to check the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number, again, is the settling velocity times the particle diameter over kinematic viscosity. So when we plug that 54.1 meters per second into the Reynolds number equation, we get a Reynolds number of 558,800, which is a little bit greater than 0 0.1. Therefore, you do not have laminar settling and using the laminar equation is incorrect. Okay, so you made the assumption and your assumption's wrong. Why did you make the assumption? You didn't feel like doing the trial and error solution. I get it, that's fine. But now you know you have to use the trial and error solution. And that means you take this form of the settling velocity equation, and we're going to develop a trial and error approach to solve for it. So this is gonna be the trial and error approach. We're going to assume a drag coefficient, and we'll talk about how to assume one and why. 
And when we make that, we're going to call that C sub D A. It's the assumed drag coefficient. Once we do that, again, when you look at the equation highlighted above, we already know everything on the right-hand side. By assuming of the drag coefficient, you can solve for the settling velocity. Once you solve for the settling velocity, you can now compute the Reynolds number. By computing the Reynolds number, you can either go to the figure or use that clifton galvan equation if you meet the conditions on the range that's applicable and find a drag coefficient. And we're gonna call that CDC, that's the computed drag coefficient compared to the one we assumed up above. So if you're within 5% accuracy, and I wanna underscore these are absolute values. If the absolute value of your error is equal or less than 5%, you're done. That, what that means is your guess on the drag coefficient was basically what you calculated. And you already have the settling velocity up above. So you're done. If you're a really good guesser. However, if you're not so good at guessing and your error is greater than 5%, you have to repeat the process. And what you would do is use that computed drag coefficient just up above as your next guess. So that becomes your assumed drag coefficient for your next trial. And you keep repeating until you have met that tolerance that the error is less than 5%. So it's actually uh, not that hard to do. And it actually um, converges very quickly unless you're at very, very low Reynolds number, but not laminar. So. What should be your first guess? When you look at this figure, you see that the drag coefficient hovers at about 0 0.4 for a little over three, uh, uh, two orders of magnitude. So that's not a bad place to start with 0 0.4. You can guess anything you want and you will ultimately successfully achieve a solution. The better your first guess, the faster you achieve your solution. So again, a good start when you're looking at large particles and, and uh, typical materials that we look to settle out. Uh, soil, gravel, which is typically uh, close to a silicate, silicate type of material, which has a specific gravity of 2.6 to 2.65. So again, this is a good first starting place. Do you have to start there? Absolutely not. The process is the same, no matter where you start. So here's the equation we're trying to solve. The first thing we're going to do is look at the right-hand side. The right-hand side, we know the particle size, it's um, 10 millimeters, which is 0.01 meters. And we know the particle specific gravity, that's given as 2.5. So the right-hand side is just a number. 0.196 meters squared per second squared. So C sub D, V S squared. C sub D is dimensionless. The drag coefficient is a dimensionless number. Velocity has the dimensions of length per time, here meters per second. Velocity squared has the dimensions of meters squared per second squared. So this equation is dimensionally consistent. So if we rearrange this equation and solve for the settling velocity, what we have is the settling velocity is 0.196 meters squared per second squared divided by the drag coefficient. And what we're gonna do is assume the drag coefficient, calculate V sub S, calculate the Reynolds number, check the drag coefficient, look at our error. So first try, a good start, Again, for spheres is a drag coefficient of 0.4. So this is going to be my assumed drag coefficient. Knowing the drag coefficient with the equation we just developed, we can solve for the settling velocity. So the settling velocity turns out to be 0.7 meters per second. Knowing 
the particle diameter is 0 0.01 meters and the kinematic viscosity of the fluid 1.41 times 10 to the minus six meters per, per second. We come up with a Reynolds number and the Reynolds number is 4,638. All following the procedure I gave you in the previous slides. With that Reynolds number, again, we can go to the chart or we can use the equation. Remember this clifton galvan equation is good for a Reynolds number less than 300,000. We have a Reynolds number of 4,638. That's less than 300,000. We can use this equation. And when we use this equation, what we get is the computed drag coefficient is 0 0.368. We assumed 0 0.4. So now we can check our tolerance or how bad we were. 0.4, and remember these are absolute values, minus 0.368 assumed minus computed over assumed is 8%. Is that greater or less than 5%? It's greater than 5%, so we need to try again. What's gonna be our next guess? 0.368. Okay, so this is gonna be a second try. In the second trial, we start at an assumed drag coefficient of 0.368. We then compute the settling velocity from that drag coefficient. We then compute I think it's 1.1. Let me just go back and check. It's 1.5. I was close. So we get a new Reynolds number. With that Reynolds number, we go again to the clifton Govan equation and we get a computed drag coefficient of 0.388. When we check the tolerance, we're still not below the tolerance. The tolerance is less than or equal to or greater than 5%. In this case, we're greater than 5%. So we need to do another trial. What is our next guess? It's the value we just calculated. And what you would see in the third trial, the assumed and the calculated just, if I had carried more accuracy, they're not the same. Out at the fourth or fifth place, they're different. But for the accuracy you're looking at, you basically have a 0% error. So again, you have the settling velocity from before. Once you have met, the tolerance, less than or equal to 5% error, the assumed and the computed drag coefficients. So this is the last page in your handout. And what you see in it is there's a log log plot of settling velocity V sub S versus particle size. Instead of uh, settling velocity versus Reynolds number or Reynolds number versus coefficient of drag. And this is for quartz or silica particles. So the specific gravity is approximately 2.65. And I think I give you the reference from this for this. It's from Hunter Rouse back in the 1930s. And uh, what you see is there's a laminar zone. Remember when the Reynolds number is less than 10 to the one, it's laminar. For engineering purposes, again, people will use the laminar equations up to a Reynolds number of one. 
And you can see how that is almost a linear relationship between 0.1 and 1. There is some deviation there. And then the higher and higher the particle size, the more and more deviation from the linear or laminar relationship. Okay, so if you think about this, if you had a particle uh, of 0 0.2 millimeters, that's where I just put the circle on the vertical axis. The real settling velocity is about um, 20 millimeters per second, say 22 millimeters per second. If you had used laminar theory, you would have had uh, a little over 30 millimeters per second. Why? By assuming laminar, you're assuming you have a much lower drag coefficient. By having a lower drag coefficient, particle weight being constant, the velocity has to go up. So again, the drag force, I'm putting a zero over the drag force. That's the weight and the buoyant force difference. That doesn't change. By assuming a laminar settling characteristic, you are assuming you have a much lower drag coefficient than you really do. And the only way to make this equation an equality is to have the velocity, the settling velocity in this case, go up. So again, this is the problem when you're assuming laminar settling when you really don't have it. Um, this diagram Those environmentals may have heard it as called the Newton-Ruby-Stokes settling characteristics. Stokes is the laminar zone. Newton, if you look at this, this is becoming linear again up there. That's where the inertial form is basically uh, getting more and more turbulent. And in between, Ruby had the uh, theory that connected Stokes and Newton ranges. So not uncommonly, they call a diagram like this, a Newton-Ruby-Stokes diagram, because it talks about all the different zones. And then lastly, again, uh, it may be abstract to you what these particles are. So for example, today we looked at particles that were two millimeters, and two millimeters is right at the edge of what we would consider a coarse sand or a fine gravel. And then we looked at something that was 10 millimeters. And remember, there's um, 10 millimeters per centimeter. So 10 millimeters is a one centimeter particle. And there's 2.54 centimeters per inch. So a 10 millimeter particle is you know, um, a fraction of an inch. The two millimeter particle is, is much, much smaller. When you're looking at designing systems and you look at these settling velocities, I'm going to go to the previous slide. When you look at this, <coughs> If we're trying to get a sand size particle, so here we have a two millimeter particle. 10 to the zero is one millimeter. So two times 10 to the zero is two millimeters. We would have a settling velocity on the order of say 260 millimeters per second. If uh, 260 millimeters per second is about a quarter of a meter per second, right? So if you had a tank that was one meter high, it would take four seconds for the particle to start at the surface and go to the bottom. If you had a tank that was two meters long and you had a velocity of two meters per second, that same particle in one second would be at the end of the tank. In one second, it would have only gone down 0.25 meters. Again, this is how everything is synthesized together. When do we do this? Water treatment, wastewater treatment, erosion and sediment control around any construction project. So there is a range and that range is somewhere in here. So that's somewhere between um, say, uh, 
well, let's say it's right around um, 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters. I'll go to the next page. So at 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters, somewhere in here, we're talking about fine sands. Those we can typically get out by settling. Particles finer than that, we would need enormous systems for them to settle out. So typically what we will do is one of two things. We'll abandon settle, sedimentation for either coagulation. So one way to get those little particles out is to lump them together and get them to stick to each other. So in uh, drinking water plants or even erosion control systems, we'll add alum or something else that makes flocks or makes particles stick together, which makes them effectively a larger and heavier particle. Or we'll filter it out. So we'll either use a permeable media or we'll use some type of fabric or something else. We'll put the water through it and it will filter that out. That's what we do in stormwater management. We'll filter the, the stormwater runoff through say a manufactured soil or sand. Why? Because the median particle size for stormwater particles is somewhere down here. It's on the order of 40 to 80 microns. So um, I'm out of time. Are there any questions? Okay, so Friday, we're gonna be doing something completely different. All right, that's it.